Right, it's Gadget UK here again. As you can see, this time we're looking at a Neo Geo CD. It's in uh, remarkable condition. There's barely uh, a mark on this all the way around it. I'm very impressed, actually. There was a screw rattling around inside. I've removed the four screws. Uh, you can see there's just four screws on the underside there to get inside this. It's got a proprietary connector here uh, that's unique to this uh, device, you know, three pins. You saw the power supply I fixed in the previous video there, so we can use that to get this up and running. Um, I always buy faulty things, you know, faulty for power supplies, faulty controllers. In fact, I've got one of the original controller pads that can go with, with this that was originally faulty as well. So, yeah, it would be all three components faulty, but uh, all should hopefully be working. So, this is described as not reading discs, so we'll connect this up now, and we'll give it a try and just see what it's doing. So the first thing to check, as per the previous video, is when you power it on, obviously the, the red light should stay there. And you can hear it's working, and at the point of the screen, you can see it's booting up. And it's waiting for a disc. Now there is an audio disc in, and it's just saying insert CD, so yeah, there's a problem. So we've got the screen up, let's just see what happens when we press the uh, switch down here. Just watch the laser. Yeah, I don't think you can see that. I can actually see laser activity. Let me try and move the camera just a bit uh, nearer and I'll see if I can zoom you in. Not just bobbing up and down, but actually I can see the red uh, laser. You've got to look, don't look directly at it. See so if I can move it over like that. Can you see that? Yeah, you can just about see the top right -hand corner of it there, a little red uh, beam, I think. Yeah, it's not that visible. It's more visible to my eye than it is on the camera there. But the fact it's bobbing up and down there and we've got the red uh, laser indicates that that seems alright. I think, uh, I mean there could be something wrong with the spindle here, maybe that's the problem. Maybe it needs a new spindle motor or maybe the driver chip on the uh, PCB is faulty, you know the HB driver for controlling this. It would be useful if we could try and move the carriage up a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if we can do that without damaging it from the top side here. I might just try and move the carriage from the underside further up here and just see if it seeks back. The other thing we'll do is clean the laser up, the lens, because it looks a little bit dirty to me. It's hard to tell. It doesn't look very uh, clear. It kind of looks a bit opaque. It may well be that uh, you know the plastic there's had something happen to it because it, it doesn't kind of look as uh, glossy, you know, as shiny, as transparent, I guess is the right word I'm looking for, uh, as to what they, they should look. But anyway, we'll do those few things. I'll clean that, like I said, we'll move the carriage up and we'll just see, see if it moves around. So I did move the carriage up there. I've missed it now because when I shut it, yeah, it moved all the way down. I've cleaned the laser lens. Let's just uh, give that another go. <laughs> Bear in mind, this is a burnt disc, so it's not going to read as well as a uh, press disc. Yeah, I can hear it bobbing up and down, but it's just not reading the disc at all. Uh, I may try a press disc, I don't know. I'm just trying to gauge whether that's been pressed down. Sometimes these spindles here get pressed down a little bit, but it doesn't feel that way. It's hard to tell. Now if you remember that screw that was missing, it was this one here, this one was floating around inside the case. Uh, so obviously, you know, before I powered it up, the first thing I did was remove those four screws and find that screw. That was why I took the screws out. Um, but that could indicate that someone's had this board off and they've been tinkering with some of the parts underneath for the focus and the tracking adjustments. So that is not out of the realms of possibility. We're seeing laser activity. That doesn't bode well, actually. It could well be that we've got a fault on this board. Um, maybe something to do with the laser side of things, um, you know, the actual uh, RF signal, maybe it's not being processed at all, so you can't even detect the disc or something like that, I don't know. If you cast your mind back to the video I did when I looked at Beeps' Neo CD, uh, I wasn't able to get it working, and I'll show you what I think was wrong with his, actually. I couldn't find the chip, I couldn't find any information on the chip, but we'll have a look at that. I just hope this has not got the same fault. But this is the CD that I, uh, the laser, sorry, that I bought as a spare. So we've got a brand new Sharp, uh, you can see the part number there, H8147AF uh, laser. So hopefully this is going to be exactly what we need here and yeah fingers crossed this might just get it up and running so uh, yeah just looking at that that looks like it's the 
the same for me, it's got the same connections there, this looks the same. Bear in mind this is going to be uh, you know, a, a cheap Chinese one. So we don't even know whether this works actually. But we've got nothing to lose so yeah I'll get the uh, screws out of here to free the mechanism up and uh, we'll swap the laser over. So that's the four screws out, I've pulled this connector off here. Just carefully disconnect these two here. Uh, you can see which way that went round because those are exactly the same size I think, or are they? No they're not, they're different sizes so you can't get those mixed up, that's good. Yeah, so if memory serves, the, the first thing to do is to remove this plastic housing here. And then you can see a screw down here, uh, sorry you can't quite see that screw there. That holds the bar and you can then sort of get the unit out. It should be straightforward. And you can see where it's clipped in here, it's clipped on at this end there, and there'll probably be another clip down on the front somewhere, yeah, under there, there we go. And you can see then that this just lifts off like that, hinges at the back, you know, the, the, these two clips here at the front are what hold it into the metal chassis there. Uh, and as I say, if we undo this screw here now, the laser unit should come straight off without any issue. Yeah, there's another screw down this side here. I think we'll undo that as well. I'm quite surprised no one's just tried swapping the laser on this, but then again, it uh, can be quite hard trying to find lasers for these drives. Yeah, so if I just lift one side of that washer there, it should come up, I think. You've got to be careful you don't flip these off and lose it to never to be seen again. I've got some replacements of these if I uh, lose it, but I don't want to lose it. Yeah, I can see the split there, just can't get the darn thing off. There we go. Oh. Have I lost it? <laughs> I think I've lost it. I think it's gone. I don't know where it went. Yeah, I found that washer, so um, I don't see any SD, you know, safety uh, blob on this. There should be a blob of solder sometimes that you've got to remove, well, more often than not. And I don't see one at all on this anywhere, actually. Anyway, the potentiometer's in the same point now, so let's just connect this up and give this a go. So it wants to go this way around. Um, that piece there wants to hook onto the underside of that plastic rail. Like that can then get this bar back in position which should I think go into the little hole underneath let's just see where that is we can stick that bar on first actually there we go make it a bit easier uh, and then what we can do at this stage is just screw that bar back into position get the two screws at either end and then we'll put the gear back on these screws need to be tight enough just to hold the bar stop it from moving I mean, you can see you've got a little notch on each end of the uh, metal chassis here just to stop that bar from sliding out of position. But still, just you know, don't over tighten them, don't uh, make, sure, you know, make sure they're not too slack. But that should be it. Yeah, so that can be up and down. We'll get some mollicot on there later. At this point, I'm just trying to see if I can get some signs of life out of this um, other than what it's doing at the moment, which is not a lot. So I'll put the gear back on and just rotate it like that so you can see the carriage moving with it. And then just try and gradually push it down onto the one below. Don't force it, just you know turn a little bit until it slides down. Otherwise the teeth will, you know, the teeth on the top gear will shatter the ones off the bottom gear, or vice versa. Um, and then we'll just carefully get this little clip back on here, if I can, without losing it, like I did before. I was lucky, it just landed on top of the mechanism somewhere, I can't remember what it was, it was somewhere on here I think. Now bear in mind, I haven't, uh, this hasn't been calibrated or anything, so it might struggle with uh, burnt media, let's try that. Oh, activity, wow. Now you can hear it slipping, obviously because the tray's not shut, so let's try that. Um, put you the screen. Let's just see what happens. I don't know whether it will boot again that way, or whether I'll need to power, it, power cycle it, whether it's going into, yeah, it's gone to the audio tracks, isn't it? So I'll switch it off, switch it on, and let's see what happens. And as I say, it may struggle to read 
that type of media. In fact, I think it is doing. I think it's struggling, isn't it? Because that would have just loaded straight away if there wasn't an issue. But the laser voltage has not been set, you know, and someone could have messed around with those pots on the board. Uh, I mean, that does seem to be working. Um, let me connect a controller up and we'll see if we can play an audio track. It's going to need some adjustment because it's not reading every track here. Yeah, it's struggling to find certain tracks, but like that track three, I think it was, it was playing all right. Was it four? Let's try an actual pressed audio CD. So I've got seventh guest audio track in. Let's try that audio disc rather. It's not doing much. I mean, you can hear it moving. Yeah, I think it needs a slight laser voltage adjustment. Bear in mind, like I said, this laser it was in and out of beeps as uh, Neo CD, and the pot perhaps isn't optimal where it is. I will uh, later, perhaps in this video, get the scope up to this and you know have a look at the RF uh, signal just to see where it is because it should be perhaps around between 900 millivolts and a volt, probably something like that on a system like this. So we're a few days later here, and uh, where are we? Well, as you can see, we're kind of exposed here. It made sense to take, you know, the spindle thing here off the, the you know, the drawer. I'll show you in a second, not really the drawer, but the lid. Detach that, because then you can expose this all here. And you can see I've just got this sat on a box here, and this is, you know, not really the safest way of doing this. I just wanted to just isolate it from the board, be able to get access to these pots here. Somebody has clearly wildly changed these. And the, the clue, as I said earlier on at the start of the video here, was one of the screws was missing on this PCB. You know, if you find screws missing there, it looks like it's been tinkered with. It's a fair, a fair bet that somebody's been in and messed around with these. It really is super annoying because there's just absolutely no point in adjusting these here. If the laser's on its last legs, you know, tweaking the pots on the laser itself there, that's, that's the only thing you really need to do. You could just tweak the uh, focus gain uh, FG, whatever that is, I think that's that one there, a little bit, one way or the other. But before you move pots like this, you know, I'd draw a little mark down the side of the pot, you know, perfect straight line, and I did that the minute I uh, took this board off, before I've made any adjustments, before, you know, because it could have been correct, as it was, it could have been correct, and I suspected not, I suspected it had been messed with. Um, and yeah, I've confirmed that because even after messing around with this for a good 30 minutes, I couldn't get it to read. Uh, you saw it play an audio track before on one disc and a press disc. That was super hard to get it to do that. It was super, super hard to get it to play that one track. And then after I demonstrated that, I couldn't play any more tracks and it wouldn't even play that same track again. It's uh, It was super unreliable. Um, now, having set these pots all back in the center position, it's a lot more reliable. It can read a disc and it can read discs reliably actually. Now there's two elements to this that are confusing things. One is temperature related. I found that when you first power this on, and I can perhaps demonstrate that now, if I just stick uh, a copy of Metal Slug 2 in there, I'm pressing the switch down, it's not doing anything. It's not doing anything at all. Now I found that if you leave this for a few minutes to warm up, it will then start being able to see the disc. Now I've got the hot air here and I've been experimenting heating the caps actually on the PCB here because I'm wondering if one of the caps there is the issue. Uh, but there's certainly a, a number of problems with this uh, Neo CD. It's not just the laser and in fact we may find that the old laser actually works. It might, it might be nothing wrong with the laser because this is more or less what it was doing to start with. It's very strange. Now it could be that the replacement laser I've got is not grey and it's needing to warm up. But I mean if I take this off here and press that, you can see it bobbing up and down. And if I look at it the right light carefully, I can see the laser. You can see it's red. It's just really weird how when this system is cold it can't read the disc at all. Now again, that could be because of the calibration heat settings here. 
that I'm borderline on just barely being able to read the disc. And as it's warming up, for whatever reason, you know, you get this is the thing, you get tolerance changes with temperature and stuff. That is normal. That would be normal in a working system. That as the system's warmed up, you'd expect a you know a level to have shifted just ever so slightly. And if you're on the very edge of not being able to read something, that can make all the difference. So there may be nothing wrong with the caps here. And I did try heating the caps yesterday and uh, I wasn't getting anywhere with it actually. It didn't seem to be related to the temperature of this board. But it, it did seem to be temperature related. Uh, I mean, you can see now, I've pressed that again. It's just not doing anything. I can hear it bobbing up and down, but it's not doing anything. So I did spend uh, just a minute there heating, and as I focused on this area here, that was when it started to be able to read the disc. I mean, it's still not reading the disc. It's saying, wait for a moment. Ah, oh, there goes. It's actually come up, I'll show you. You see that? And it says press start. So if I just carefully press start now, it might not load, because bear in mind it hasn't fully warmed up. Spinning the disc. Wow, it's loaded. So there you go. So I'm thinking the first aspect to this is those capacitors actually. Um, certainly on that side. I think I'm going to swap those out first in advance of the new Panasonic ones coming. And we'll just see if that makes it any more reliable. But what I will need to do is get the, uh, you know, find the RF uh, pad on here. And there isn't, it's not marked. I don't see it anywhere, actually. So I'm going to have to probe around, try and find what uh, should be the RF test pad. Scope it. Uh, and have a play with these pots to see if I can get the RF level uh, stable. And obviously, you know, the tracking and stuff is probably going to need tweaking a little bit as well. But, as you can see, I mean, that's loading. It's loading very, very, very slowly. And that shows me, you know, it's, it's out of uh, calibration. It's not, that is not optimal. It should be zo zooming along a lot quicker than that. These are slow at loading, but not that slow. And I do know that as this is warms up further, that will speed up. You know, if I came back five minutes, ten minutes from now and tried loading this, that would have loaded already. You know, you'd see quite a regular movement on the bar, just going do, 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 all the way along. Whereas at the moment, it's like stopping for ages and seems to be taking ages for each little bit. I would estimate that's probably three or four times slower than it perhaps should be. So you can hear it's a bit slow finding the track there. But when it warms up, it, it doesn't do that. It's super quick. Bit slow again. Yeah, I forgot there's a second loading, but <laughs> the joy of CD loading. Yeah, it took ages slow that, like three minutes or something. But yeah, you can hear it's working. Looks awful and composite, it's blurry. So I've made another bit of a breakthrough in understanding what's going on. It's not, it doesn't seem to be temperature because I've connected the scope up. You can see I've got the ground here to one of the ground straps that uh, goes over to that drive. And the curious thing is, it's now not reading the disc at all, despite the system having warmed up. So I think it's all about grounds, actually. It may well be that, uh, you know, as we're testing like this now, with the, the chassis, you know, the main part of the drive here is not grounded properly. And somehow that's interfering. I'm going to show you what's going on the screen here. You can see, and it's still spinning, spinning, spinning. It's not. It's like it's not. It's not working correctly. It's not able to read the disc. It stops now. And just watch what happens. I'm just going to disconnect the uh, ground from the scope from the chassis there, and I'll switch it off. And just carefully hold it onto the PCB where it should be, so that that chassis is now grounded. So spin it up and just watch the difference. It comes up with a please wait message. Just give it a sec. It's when the main, uh, you know, CD player. Look there. Wait for a moment. That's the difference. So while I'm probing this, I'm going to have to temporarily join that up. Yeah. So as you saw, that was working. So I'm going to have to, uh, you know, put a ground. Onto there, clip onto that. <sighs> yeah, I really should not be doing this on the carpet. It's not the safe place to do it. But uh, yeah, I have no other space to work in at the moment. So I'm we'll just clip this on here like that. 
but this is uh, interesting because that shows that the connections here need to be super clean when you've got that screwed on that could have been part of the original problem as well so yeah I'll clean these uh, up on both sides with a fiberglass pen afterwards because yeah we've clearly having some major issues reading when we've not got uh, a good uh, ground and the interesting thing is we're talking about on the chassis here you know the the drive logic uh, here has got its own ground the, there are grounds passed with these signals here to the independent things on the thing itself so you've got to wonder why what's the significance of you know the ground here affecting the read but yeah nevertheless it's having an impact so i'll just see if that ground is reliable now let's uh, carefully just move the mechanism away make sure nothing's shorting switch it on I mean, there may still be a temperature thing, you know, I'm not ruling that out. It seems a bit strange it wouldn't read the drive at all, to start with. But you see, that's different. If you've not got that ground strap between the chassis and the board there, you don't get that. And I'm guessing if I go to a track now, and this is seventh guess, by the way, in the CD, Philips CDI, it's the audio disc. And it may struggle as we go up the disc, because the tracking might not be right, I don't know. But it seems all right. It's working. Anyway, I'm gonna have a probe around with the scope now. Let's see if we can find the RF uh, pad. So the next step here, and I'll show you in a sec the board up close. The RF, well, there is an RF signal here, actually. Let's just uh, see if we can brighten that a little bit for you. Now I'm not sure if that's it. that is the actual RF test pad, it's certainly the eye pattern there. If I now adjust the uh, FO port, focus output, just watch this. Can you see it goes larger than smaller, larger than smaller. And uh, if you cast your mind back to the retro game mods video, what you want is to get an optimal signal there. So you know you want to, you know, let's put it around to its extreme right okay, so it's, um so that's its lowest level, it's extreme, and if I just go clockwise, just watch, it gets bigger, 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 I think, and then it starts to get smaller. So we need to just stop when it's at its maximum size there. So, you know, optimising the uh, RF uh, level there, that way. So, let's have a go at the tracking uh, TB. I just want to see what effect that has on the uh, RF. There you go. Oh, we lost it totally there. Let's just turn back the other way. And again, can you see the signal getting smaller? And bigger, smaller, bigger. Again, there's a sweet spot about there. So that was TB. Uh, the next one's TG, tracking gain. One or two of these, we may not see a relationship to the signal. Yeah, this one is a good example. Oh, you can see it's starting to wobble there, look at that. As I straighten it out. Go the other way. Yeah, again, there's a sweet spot where it's pretty good. And it's almost in the middle, actually, on this one. But again, that's not the right signal to be scoping to see the effect that that's having. Uh, and the final one's TO tracking output. And again, look at the level, can you see it going up and down? Yeah, I would suggest that's in an optimal position there. So having done those adjustments, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, testing there just to see how much more reliable that is. I do need to tweak the uh, pot on the laser itself as well and monitor that RF signal at the same time. Just to try and uh, get it a little bit higher, because at the moment I've got uh, one division is representing uh, 200 millivolts. Yeah, so yeah, so not as plain sailing as I first uh, made out here, actually. Testing with my erotica disc here, Madonna. Uh, switch this on. You'll see that it's uh, as soon as you get to the outer tracks. This has got 13 tracks on this disc, and in fact the RF level it's not brilliant. It's still you know 600 millivolts. That's what I kind of left it at before. That's a bit low. And as you get to the outer tracks, that seems to drop, actually. And I think that's why... Uh, sorry, I'm just touching the disc here. If I just press play now, let's put track 7 on. That hopefully should play. Let's 
struggle to read that, isn't it? But could you see the RF level was quite weak there compared to what it was before? Let's just put track four on. Yeah, that's working all right. Uh, I'll just need to mute that or I'm going to get a copyright strike. So, uh, yeah, some more adjustment needs to be done. Well, I've just spent the last, uh, I kid you not, two hours messing around with this thing. I've muted it. The final thing that was wrong with this is the spindle height had been adjusted. Someone's messed with the spindle height as well. I know that because what was happening on a press disc like this one here, this Madonna disc, 14 tracks on it, by the time you got to about track 8 or 9, it was having serious problems either tracking or focusing and I completely eliminated the tracking. The tracking was not the issue. I could get it to play a CDR perfectly, all 20 tracks right to the edge of the disc there. No problems at all. Uh, well, I say right to the edge of the disc. There's 20 tracks on there. The disc is uh, not full actually. So the upper tracks on here would be on the uh, outer edge there. Um, and I suspect maybe even that disc has got more of a wobble, this one here than uh, the CDR that was using. But as you you know, you get a wobble, the outer edge becomes harder to read because you've got more of a wobble on the outer side than you do on the inner side. You know, the inner side bobs up and down a bit like that. If you've got a, you know, a, just because of the nature of the way these discs are made, you can have a wobble like that on the outside. Just, you know, it might be half a millimetre or something, not a lot. And if the focus Sorry, you know that spindle, if that spindle is not the right height, the tolerance there you've got for your focus, is the margin is very small. So you can read the inner tracks, but not the outer ones. And that's exactly what it is. I literally pulled the spindle up by about, I don't know, a quarter to half a millimetre. It naturally seemed to pull up as if someone had pressed it down. You know, it came up just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. And as soon as I did that, this disc is now reading all the way to the end. But prior to that, I kid you not, I've tried every combination possible here. I've messed with the focus, didn't make a difference at all. In fact, as soon as I started messing with the focus, I got to the point where I couldn't read a disc again. And then I would have to go back to using that 7th Guest CDR, to, because that reads super well, actually, that disc. It really, uh, reads really well on this. No matter what the pots are set at, it'll read it. So I could use that, use the scope, you know, do what I did early on where I showed you setting the focus with the you know, um, RF level there on the scope. Got that working, put this disc back in, okay up to about track 7 or track 8 suddenly it wouldn't read again play around with the tracking again uh, that would didn't make any difference in fact it didn't make it didn't make any difference at all you could not get it to read beyond about track 8 or track 9 put the uh, copy of metal slug I've got here you know uh, that would st stop at around track uh, 7 adjusted the tracking here these two adjustments here the uh, TG and TO is it I think yeah those two adjustments there this one here you can literally leave that just set I'll show you where it's set in a minute and I, I set that according to a photo of this board actually and that is the exact position that needs to be anywhere either side of that it, you start getting problems so that one is super easy to set um, so coming back to these two again after tinkering with these two into the positions they're in now I found that with CDR media I could read all the way up to track 20 on that metal slug but this disc was still not reading beyond track 8 or track 9 and it was only when I adjusted the spindle suddenly that's it, all problems solved it's uh, yeah, it's like I say it was on the very very edge so as soon as you get further out onto the um, disc the, the slight wobble there's not enough compensation in the focus it can't adjust enough to take into account the height that the spindle had been pressed down so, just testing with the audio disc now, if we could track one. And we just go up the tracks here. See, it's pretty quick at seeking, no issues at all. And it's silent as well, you know. We're not getting like overactivity on the tracking and focus coils there as we were with the way the pots were originally configured in fact it just was not reading the disc at all to start with even after warming up so I am curious to see whether the whole warm up thing is still an issue does it still need to warm up I don't know I think at this stage now I'm just going to test out uh, a few games Let's try Mott Slug 2 here
I'd be interested to see what the load time's like now. It should have improved a little bit having done those uh, adjustments there. Yeah, but it didn't take long to actually read the disc there either. That's a good sign. I think previously it took quite a while to come up with a pressed start. So you look at the progress bar there now. That's moving a lot more lin in a linear sort of fashion regards speed. Had a little struggle there where it was reading a different track. But I think that's probably normal. And again there. And I think probably again towards the end here it does it. But yeah, I would say that's uh, that's pretty good now actually. So let's hit start. Yeah, so that's a lot better, considerably better. I think we get into the loading thing now, don't we? Yeah, we do. CD load times on the Neo CD, but you know I can live with it. Mission one. Start. And if you get the uh, CDZ, the newer model, that's a uh, double speed drive, I think. So, you know, it's twice as quick. But the good thing with this model, this particular revision, the early one, top loader, is copy protection. There isn't any. You know, you can just literally put it, play anything on it, I think. With the CDZ, some discs won't work without uh, a hack to the disc, you know, mod. Yeah, I'm trying to play with my left hand only. Incidentally, the AES RGB lead will work on this. I'll show you that in a minute. But the one I've got is wired for. It's got a stereo 3.5 mil uh, lead fly lead that comes off it. So at the moment, I've got no sound. But what I could do is just get it to uh, two RCA slash phono to 3.5 mil cable, and that'll adapt that to work perfectly. Uh, yeah, it's me if there's just the time base there that's made it shift across. But uh, yeah, so that's what it looks like on track one. And if we go to say, I don't know, track 20, let's just jump up. Yeah, that's track 20. So you can see how much wobble we've got on track 20. But anyway, nevertheless, that's the RF level. So if I move that down to here, we've got like one, two, three. It's about three and three quarters there, something like that. So that's how I have this set now, but that's with the CDR. I'll just put that pressed audio disc back in, and you can see what uh, we're looking at with a pressed CD. So I use that Madonna disc again. So this is a pressed CD, and then you can see we've got one, two, three, four, and a, I don't know, a third or something. So, you know, we're above kind of 800 millivolts there, roughly. Maybe 850, 870, something like that. Uh, but it's working perfectly. So I don't want to adjust that further at this stage. Um, I, I might revisit this if there's any need to. But as I said before, post down in the comments below if you've got one that's been unaltered, untampered, you know, an original uh, one with its original laser, and you've got a scope and you can measure the test pad, I'll show you in a sec. Please measure it and uh, post down below. So I'll show you close up the board now, but I'm going to reassemble it. We'll get some mollycott onto the rail there, I can show you that, uh, and onto the gears as well. Um, and then I think we'll just carefully reassemble it and test it. The, t the test, the big test that re it remains with this is the cold start. Because as I said, you know, when this is being powered off and it's being cold, I found it didn't even read a disc at all. Uh, so that is still in the back of my mind as, you know, a, a problem. Capacitors, bad connection... Maybe a problem with the power supply, I don't think so. That has been recapped apart from the one large uh, main cap on there, and I don't think that would cause this issue, if I'm honest. So here's a close-up of the board here. TO, tracking output, is that a tracking offset? I am honestly not sure. Output, I would think. Um, so you can see where that's uh, you know aligned to, if you like. And the interesting thing is, just comparing to a photo I have, and I'll show you that in a sec, they're not dissimilar, they're in a very, very similar position. So actually, in retrospect, I could have set, the, set these all like that and then just tweaked as I measured the RF and listened to it to see if we had any wine from the, uh, uh, you know, the coils, because you've obviously got coils inside here, you know, the tracking and the uh, focus. Uh, anyway, so you've got uh, tracking balance here. Uh, now this is the one that's super finicky. If it's not in that exact 
position that I've got that there you know you turn it a degree one way or the other you start to get problems so that is super easy to set actually you know when you've got problems if that's not set in the right place it won't track at all you can't even get it to play a single you know track one on a disc kind of thing it, it makes the right noise you can hear the, uh, the tracking coils going for it um, these two I'm not sure how those compare to the photo I'm going to show you in a sec but uh, yeah that's how I ended up with an optimal clean RF signal for both uh, pressed and uh, you know CDRs and stuff. When I looked at Brian's uh, Neo CD, the uh, that's Neo C, the only other Neo CD video I've got on my channel. I spent quite a lot of time. I swapped this out. I think we swapped the RF uh, chip out here. Uh, I couldn't get either of these. This was what I suspected was the fault, and I couldn't find anything on that. If you know what that chip is, and I'm guessing it's some kind of amplifier an op amp or something because it's connected to the uh, connections that go straight to the uh, laser there actually and you've got one, two, three, you've got six connections there so I'm guessing you've probably got the like the RF signal or something coming back you know the, the laser signal uh, but you've also got the tracking coils uh, and focus coils and I'm guessing it's you know it's, it, there's a relationship there I mean it might not be it's it's in the right place isn't it it's right next to it but uh, yeah it kind of looks like maybe it's some sort of op amp or something like that I mean this is your BTL driver down here so you know this again is controlling those uh, coils and things you know that has an influence on them um, so yeah I'm not sure maybe that is just something to do with the uh, the RF f feed into here I'm honestly not sure but this is like I think an RF uh, I can't remember what it's called now uh, and that's some sort of RF processor or something yeah so we need to clean up these here because that ground connection, as I've shown, makes uh, a huge difference. You've not got a ground between these properly, despite the fact that there's nothing really on the metal chassis here that I could understand uh, needing a ground. It's uh, nevertheless, it makes a big difference. So I may recap this as I say. I've ordered some decent Panasonic caps, but I'm not 100% sure at this stage whether that's required. And finally, before I forget, the RF test pad is there well it's not I don't know whether it's definitely the RF test pad I could look up the pin out for this the data sheet because I think there is a data sheet for this but that's where I was measuring it that's where we saw the eye pattern there um, so yeah that's where you need to be looking on this particular uh, board revision And with regards to the laser pot, you can see, you know, that's just pointing up slightly that way. Same as the original one was. You can see I marked it when I got it, and it's pretty much in the same position that it came in, actually. So, you know, I've experimented tweaking this either way, you know, and the, the RF levels go up or down. But actually, on its default, it's fine. It reads everything. It reads press discs and uh, CDR media on the default setting there. So we'll get a little bit of uh, mollycott grease onto the bar and onto the gears there I think um, we'll just distribute that with the cotton bud I think it doesn't need a massive amount just on the different sides there you know try and get it all the way around uh, and then we can just rotate the carriage like this I'll put some more up here yeah I always make a mess when I'm applying this stuff you don't really need it, it doesn't need to be super thick, you just need some around the circumference there more than anything and then just, you know, I say move it up and down and we can clear off any excess with the dry cotton bud because you can see it's getting squished around all up there look. but that's okay, I'm quite comfortable with that I mean you can see actually this bit here doesn't go as far as that that part of the bar there it's kind of needs to be kind of like around there more than anything and it goes without saying if you get a drive like this obviously inspect the gears here because if you've got a tooth sm smashed off there that's going to cause you problems and it could lead you to think you've got some sort of tracking fault or a problem with the this here because let's say this spindle had been pressed down it's it's raised now you can see and I guess that's worth covering how you know it's height you can see if you look at it side on there you can see how far it stands away 
from the uh, the unit here. Yeah, so sorry, I cut myself off there. Yeah, if you've got a tooth break broken off here, off one of these, you may find it starts to struggle to read certain tracks. And again, let's say that could confuse you and think you've got a tracking fault either with your laser or the, the tracking settings on the uh, board there, and actually you don't, you've just got a missing tooth or a damaged tooth. So let's just uh, clean off that excess from around there. Yeah, because we don't need a big lump of it like that there at the end. It's not serving any purpose, is it? Um, we'll just go up and down a couple more times. We'll do the same thing up this side here, because there's no point in having all that there. It's just going to collect dust. That's all it's going to do if you leave it there. Um, we'll just get a bit onto the gear. Well, one of the gears, I think, and then try and get it to rotate around a little bit. Technically, it perhaps doesn't need it, because there was nothing on it to start with, but you know what? I kind of like to just uh, cover all bases, really just uh, try and help with the mechanical wear you know you've got a plastic on plastic like that if you've got a little bit of grease there it's uh, it's just going to assist keeping the thing uh, you know from breaking I guess so what I'm trying to do is just use the uh, molly cut on the end there just to get some onto that gear and then uh, run it around like that we're going to have loads of excess mollycott here that needs wiping off and stuff but yeah after that's gone round a number of times it uh, will assist I've got a bit of hair there look yeah that'll do uh, you know it doesn't like I say it doesn't really need it strictly speaking but just a little bit is not a bad thing. You can do the same with this gear here actually. Just like that, just a little bit, not a lot. And again just wipe off uh, the excess. So whilst we're here we'll just uh, we'll clean the laser lens as well because it's been sat around for an awful long time in the box. Yeah we'll clean this top of the spindle as well, you usually have like a bit of plastic or rubber, I and mean, you can see, you can see the brown that's come off on there, yeah it was a bit dirty. When I stick the, uh, the, the piece that goes on top of this back into the lid in a minute I'll show you that, I'll show you how to get it off as well, in case you want to work on it exposed like this, and this is the best way of doing it because you can't, you know, measure the RF, well you could, you could solder away on to measure it, but, but it's just far easier to operate it while it's exposed and work on it that way while you're taking measurements and making adjustments. It's pretty dirty that actually, a yucky brown and yellow sort of mark around it. Yeah you can see the dirt that's come off there. Yeah so we'll clip the back in first and then these pieces at the front here just tuck under and go into the metal. I think that's it actually, it's back on. Yeah. So before I fit this back in so before I fit this back in, I'm just going to clean the uh, these mounts here with a fiberglass pen. Maybe a cotton bud on IPA as well. Just because I want to make sure that when it's screwed on, we got a really good ground, because that has definitely caused me a problem. What was happening with that ground? When there was no ground between the chassis and here, it would uh, not read the disc at all, not even see. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even spin. It wouldn't even spin. You could hear it bobbing up and down, but it wouldn't spin. So, yeah, there's some sort of relationship, I'm not sure what. Because, like I say, the, the components on that uh, chassis have all got their own ground. So it's got nothing to do with that. It's not like there isn't a ground for, for the laser or for the uh, motors or whatever. It's uh, a bit mysterious, really, the behaviour that you get when it's not grounded. So just testing before I reassemble it, I just put the disc in and it was doing the same thing where it was just doing nothing. It wasn't even spinning. You can hear it bobbing up and down. Trying to focus, it's like there's no disc there. It heated up just around here for maybe 60 seconds while it was trying to read the disc, and then it started to read the disc and it read the disc perfectly. And then it's been fine whilst it's been warm, no problems at all. So, yeah, one of the caps around here is the culprit of that, actually. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's just the caps. I mean, it could be a bad solder point, but I've inspected it, I don't see anything. So, I may do that within this video, I'm not sure. I've ordered them, they're on order. Anyway, I'll show you now how you get the uh, spindle uh, thing off the top of the uh, drive bay there. 
If I hold this upside down you can see uh, the way this goes on here it slides this way like that this catch here is what holds it in so if you sort of pull that catch a little bit as you sort of try and move it backwards like that it comes out so I'm going to do the reverse here just to show you how it goes in but you've got to slide it in at an angle let me see if I can get this uh, on shot so you can see here sorry I appreciate that the light's not very good so you can see the plastic those two plastic edges there where the fingers are uh, and you need to slide it in so that it goes from the back like that and then push it so that's clipped in place now that's it and it can't come out so just try and rearrange that just so you can see a bit better you can see that black clip where my finger is there you just got to try and just pull it out a little bit as you pull this that way and upwards to get it out but yeah that's back in there now and I'm sure you've all seen flat flex connectors before millions of times but these ones on the Neo CD you just pull straight upwards like that there you go you can see it's out there uh, you have to be careful, you know, if you keep removing and inserting these a number of times, if you're not careful, the uh, silver trace there can come off the thing and float around. In fact, Beeps, uh, his Neo CD was like that before he sent it to me, because it had just had that many, you know, insertions and removals. It had started to wear, so yeah, be very careful with those. So all I need to do now is just to take this whole uh, assembly here and just mount it back on the underside of the lid. Those rubber uh, things here, you know, these, I don't know what they're called, those can sometimes be a problem, you know, a source of problems on drives like this. I know on the CD32 that has these, uh, and it can, if, if they're not, uh, you know, if they're worn, they can sag on one side, you know, your drive can sag on one side, which can sometimes mean that uh, the uh, drive doesn't sit very well inside the machine, and it means that, you know, if they're not sitting, if they're not holding the drive far enough upwards, the disc can actually uh, graze on the tray if you're not careful. So then we can just get this uh, PCB into position here. Uh, and you want to make sure you're not restricting the cables and things, because obviously these cables, you can't quite see them, but these... Yeah, sorry, you couldn't quite see that. These cables at the back here, you need to make sure they're free, you know, so that they can move up and down with the uh, optical unit as it moves around like that. Well, that's probably a good test to move it right down to the bottom there. So when you come to reattach something like this here, this cable tie, you need to make sure you're not being too restrictive with movement on those cables. You know, if you make that too tight, when the cables aren't all the way out, the drive could struggle when you come to a specific track. I mean, there's two different ways of doing this. You could do it that way, sideways like that. But you could also just do it this way, just carefully get it in position. Make sure it's uh, straight, obviously, before you start trying to push it in. Just make sure it's in. Yeah, it is. Uh, and then if we carefully, just pull you back a bit, disconnect the controller there. I'll pull a piece of captain tape. That was something I forgot to mention, you know, to hold the drive switch down so that it thinks there's a disc in all the time. Just carefully overlap it on the front here, you know, the controller ports first, and then push it down, and that's it, put the screws back in. So finally we just need to get the uh, four screws in and uh, give it a bit of a clean. It's uh, super clean though, actually, I'm impressed with the condition of this in general. I mean, you want to work on a soft surface when, you, when you've got it upside down like this, because otherwise you're going to scratch the underneath of it and uh, potentially damage the print and stuff on the... Uh, so before I clean it up I'll just uh, show you around the back as well so you can see the three pin power connector there you've got your video DIN here so you, as I say you can have RGB out of here you know I can use my cable I just need to use a splitter to go to the left right uh, here uh, and you've got S-Video as well that's nice to get S-Video built in um, and then obviously you've got composite and left right audio and of course the only thing you've got around the front is the two joystick ports there power switch and obviously your power LED. So a bit of a gentle clean with some soapy water uh, and then I'll perhaps give it a spray with some uh, back to black it just gives it a nice shine afterwards and makes the black look really deep. And my usual uh, toothbrush job here because you can see you know there's some uh, dirt inside the indentation there where it says power. I mean I could strip it down completely and get that in the sink but 
this will do the trick. Yeah, there we go, good as new. Yeah, I even took that back off to get the marks off that because there were a couple of like yucky white smears over it like, uh, I don't know, someone had some goo on their hands or something when they uh, put a disc in but as you can see that looks pretty clean now as well so I'll just clip that back in place. So it's all cleaned up, I'll just get some back to black on it. I'll just wipe that in. So yeah, we do need to read the recap this, so we've got another fold, just listen. Yeah, this is after no overnight, after being uh, left cold overnight, and it's freezing in here at the moment. It's just not seeing the disc at all. You can hear the thing focusing up and down. So this is pretty much as it was at the start of the video, actually, if you watch the laser here. You won't be able to see it, but I can see, yeah, I can see a red beam. And it's obviously bobbing up and down. Uh, sorry, my cat's uh, trying to see what's going on here. So, uh, yeah. The question is what would cause that? Is it going to be caps or is it uh, something else? One of those little quad flat packs or something with some sort of temperature related issue. The solder points all look good on that board, so I'm inclined to think it's not a bad solder connection. Anyway, we'll recap that board and just see if that fixes it. Yeah, and after about four minutes there, of just warming up, not continuously trying to, you know, read the disc and stuff, obviously, because it just gives up after it can't find the disc, it starts working. So, yeah, definitely a temperature related issue. And that's probably what's happened with this. It's had this temperature related issue. Someone suspected it's the laser. They've maybe tried swapping the laser. They've certainly messed around with all the pots, including probably the uh, voltage to the laser. And obviously that's not fixed it. They've assumed that uh, you know there's some sort of uh, you know fault somewhere on the board. Uh, I don't think they've realized actually it's temperature related. So before I recap the drive PCB, I thought we may as well just do a quick tear down of this. I'll have a look at the board, see what state the board's in. Because you know there's going to be caps and stuff up here, there's going to be some caps on the board. Let's just check those out, just make sure there's no SMD ones and just generally inspect the board to see the condition. So this PCB on the front here for the controllers, on the underside here, can you see there? Neo buff. Neo buff. Yeah, so there's a neo buff uh, in those two positions on that board on the underside. Now, I looked at this PCB previously, well, not this exact one, but this uh, type of PCB for Scott, actually, um, Scott's Game in Asylum. Uh, I'll post a link to his channel below and a link to the video. So, I did a video where he sent me this PCB and I worked on it in isolation. He didn't send me the whole system initially, it was just that PCB. He was having a controller problem. I think it, all the problem was with his is the pins here had been pushed in. And that can be a common thing with this, you know, if you get the uh, controllers and plug them in at a funny angle, if you're not careful, you can push those pins back. So anyway, I'll post a link to that video. Later he sent the whole console to me because his, his controller still wasn't working. And I never really understood or got to the bottom of what was wrong with it. I fixed it, well, it worked when I sent it back, and that's the strange thing. So I don't know whether he still had a bad connection somewhere or what. I think, one thing I do remember, there was the, a few pieces of this shield in here. It's like, it's like a silver foil. And there were a few pieces of that that somehow made their way onto the motherboard. And I found them when I was cleaning up. So bear in mind, those are going to be conductive, and I couldn't help but wonder if that was the cause of this problem, actually. And the whole thing about the damaged ports, maybe because he'd had a controller fault, and he you know, kept plugging and unplugging the controllers to try and work out what was wrong, and maybe damaged it that way as well. You know, So he had two issues, but anyway, I thought we'll uh, tear this down and have a look inside. The other thing worth pointing out, can you see someone's modded this already? That piece of wire over there, well, that might be a factory, I'm not sure, maybe this is a PAL one, but I think it's Japanese, because there was a sticker on the plastic, that was this was uh, packaged in when it came to me, and it said uh, JPN model, uh, Neo CD, so I suspect someone's bought this from Japan, had a look at it, can't fix it, sent it on to me. Well, not sent it on, they've sold it and I've bought it. Um, but yeah, this is uh, the, the Neo Buffs, four of the bits here, I think, it uh, used uh, the, you know, to read these resistor values here, whether they're open or short. The idea being that you can set the language and the region and stuff 
via these so that that bridge there is how you switch this into English so I'm guessing that just kind of looked like a little bodgy mod to me I'm guessing someone's perhaps modded this previously to turn it into English we'll have a look at that one and screw this PCB in a minute but uh, again uh, these flat flex connectors here uh, the just the ones that just pull straight up and out and to get this PCB off you need to pull that uh, connector off there as well so there you go as you can see yeah neo buff neo buff so this is also a candidate for my replacement uh, neo guff boards actually you know if you've got one of these faulty uh, this is another system that could benefit from having those uh, replacements uh, or you could use Fertex there may well be other people manufacturing them yet so there's a good dozen or so screws to get the motherboard out and I'll just show you what I showed you in the previous video actually that this is conductive it's conductive uh, paint you know it's like it's red coloured and it's got kind of funny texture to it but yeah it's conductive it's the shielding so if we lift that one screw at the back there you can see underneath here so we've got like uh, probably the encoder chip and stuff you've got the DAC up here yeah there's your 3016 uh, what else we've we got we're going to have an op amp or two I would think for the outputs and things here and what's that? Is that a Sony CXA11 something? Yeah, it is. It's a CXA 1645p. So that's your video encoder, you know, for providing your RGB and your composite and stuff. Uh, and then you've got what look like a couple of regulators and stuff here. That's uh, an LM3930T, is it something? Or 3D? I can't read that. Uh, but yeah, your voltage regulation is going to be here. I've obviously got a couple of transistors and stuff here as well, I think. Yeah, because that's marked BC base collector emitter. So those are transistors. But there's quite a lot of caps here, you know, if you're going to fully recap one of these, you might want to consider replacing all the capacitors at the back here. Um, I mean, I'm getting pretty good video output, the composite's a bit fuzzy, but I don't think that's going to be attributed to these uh, capacitors here, actually. It's just going to be the fact it's composite, and composite is awful. So to disconnect that uh, PCB, we need to uh, remove these connectors here, and there's a couple over here as well, just carefully. Uh, pull a little clip. There we go, that's that off. You also need to remove these uh, screws from the back here, the holder, you know, the connectors of the PCB as well. So the motherboard is pretty clean actually, it's a bit like Scott's was, it's in immaculate condition. There's a bit of dirt around here where the little hole was, you know, through the shield in there. So I will just clean up with some cotton buds and things. The immediate thing that's just caught my eye again, um, and I've forgotten about this, Neobuff, Neobuff, Neobuff. So there are three Neobuffs here on the motherboard as well, which again would benefit from, uh, you know, if you've got a fault there, you could use one of my Neoguff boards there. Or is it the Neo Neoduff? I forget which way around. One of my boards is a bypass, isn't it, for the GA11? I mean, there might be positional that you can bypass, I doubt it. I think they all need to be um, bi-directional. But nevertheless, I could use one of my little PCBs. So I've covered this board before, but when I kept, last came in one of these, there was a lot of stuff that I'd never seen before. I had no idea. So yeah, Neo uh, OFC. This is going to be to with the CD side of things, I think, you know, because it's bespoke to this. Uh, you've got a Sanyo chip here, again, to do with the CD audio stuff, Neo Sud, Neo Voc. Again, I think that's all to do with the CD audio stuff. Another Sanyo chip. Yeah, Sanyo, we're, we're renowned, we're producing chipsets for CD drives and things. So, again, that's going to be uh, related to the CD side of things. Z80, uh, some RAM down here. I'm guessing this is going to be uh, sound RAM. Uh, some DRAM up here, your Yamaha. So, it's got the same sound chip as the AS and the MVS. We've got some DRAM up here as well. Um, the interesting thing is DRAM, I don't remember seeing DRAM on any of the other Neo Geo boards actually, so I'm guessing that these DRAMs are going to be sound related and buffer related, you know, to the data coming to and from the CD. And obviously you can have some sort of refresh controller circuitry built into some of these quad flat packs here, I would think. Uh, you've got your PLCC68K there. Now this is where things get interesting because when I first came in one of these I was unfamiliar but you've got a uh, Neo MGA-T so according to the comment from Vertec there on the wiki, on the Neo Geo wiki the dash T is the Toshiba variant of the MGA now I can't remember when I was looking at those MV1As whether they had a straight MGA or whether it's an MGA-T but nevertheless that's the same chip so you've got exactly the same chip here that you've got on an MV1A or an MV1AX board and it's no surprise that uh, the companion chip to the MGA um, is the GRC 
So, you know, I think I was right when I talked about this being the video chip because you've got some RAMs and things here and I, you know, some ice from that, that this was the graphics chip and it is. So it's, again, it's the same, you know, the Neo GRC, you'll see that on the MV1A and the MV1AX. And the other thing worth mentioning that you may or may not have seen yet, I don't know that I've uploaded it yet, uh, the video from Mike Pearman there, the number of MVS boards, 10 MVS boards I've been looking at. The GRC contains, uh, I think, two lots of the VRAM. It contains the fast 2K VRAM and I think uh, the other VRAM, I don't forget which is it, the low? Yeah, I think it is the low. And then you have separate pallet RAM. So I'm guessing um, we're going to have some pallet RAM on here, but we're not, you know, the other two types are built into this. So if you have failure with that type of RAM, you need a new GRC. But it's interesting that you could, you know, if you want to repair one of these, you could just get a junk MV1A or AX board and uh, take, you know, those two main chips from there, if either of those was the fault. So you've got your low ROM here, that's going to be identical, I would think. It might be subtly different, but I assume that's going to be identical to the low ROM that's on an MVS, actually, in an AES. Uh, you've got your SP1 here, so this is your mask ROM. Now, you can now get a Unibars for these, thanks to the work that Rizula's done. You can get a Unibars. I'm not sure how you would mod it. What you could do is perhaps get, you know, and I've talked about this, uh, well, again, you might not have seen this video yet, one of my videos, you get a PLCC adapter that fits on top, a little PCB, and put a standard dip socket, or another, you know, more readily available SMD ROM and, and modify that way. You'd have to have a wire or two coming off and stuff and remove the old or at least disable the old ROM there. But you can um, you can do that. You can put a Unibars on these. Not a standard Unibars, it's custom to the Neo CD, obviously. Got another DRAM down here. It's a crazy amount of RAM on this board, actually. Um, but then again, there's a lot of buffering going on. You know, you've got to remember, it's got to be taking all the stuff from the CD, storing it somewhere, and then sticking it out to the various buses and things. Um, but the fact that this has got, you know, the MVS chips on here, you can see that it pretty much is, it's, as it says on the, the front, you know, it's a Neo Geo CD. So, it's, you know, it's got the Neo Geo backbone to the system. It's got all the same architecture with your 68K and your Z80 and your Yamaha. You know, it's got the same graphics um, stuff. It's got the same backbone to the system here. It's just got the CD stuff bolted on. So, uh, I always found that quite interesting. In my mind, it might have been a better seller had it had a cart slot as well. You know, imagine if you had the CD stuff and at the back there, you had the cart slot. So, it was actually an AES, but it had CD built in. That could have sold really well, but then again, it was the cost of the cartridges, the whole reason for SNK going this way and you know adopting the CD technology was it's dirt cheap to press a CD versus the crazy cost of manufacturing you know two double-sided PCBs with a giant you know they're quite large you know with a giant uh, shell and everything and the number of ROM chips and things that go on there that was kind of cost prohibitive you know and that's why um, they went down this road. And the other thing I'll point out as well, when I looked at the controller side of things for Scott and that, those previous few videos there, one of the things I did, uh, yeah, I focused on these here, because those could be a problem. Um, your controller inputs from the top board run through there, and they're isolated. They're just two four fives again. And it's it's just bonkers to me that they would go to the point, you know, of creating a, a Neo Buff, you know, putting Neo Buffs on here that contain two of these, yet in this position have two of these. It's like... Who came up with that idea? Why did they not just stick one of these here? You know, there's enough space somewhere around there to stick one of those. Or why did they just not bother with these and just have more of those? I don't know, it's just, it's crazy. Yes, these two take less space, but I mean, not a massive amount. If you look at the size of them, you can stack two of these next to each other. They're almost the same size as that. So it's just logistics. It's easier, I guess, because of the connectivity of having, you know, the number of connections on each side there. But still, you know, it's a bit of a mismatch. And the other strange thing with that is, obviously you've got the Neo Buffs on the controller board as well. So you've, you've got the, 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 what's the word? You've got the, the gated access there, if you like, to the controller already. So you're kind of doubling up. You've got two, you've got, you know, and it's like having a Neo Buff and then on the other side of it, having another Neo Buff. You know, you've got twice the things going on here. It's, I don't know, it just seems crazy to me. I've never really, uh, never understood why they did that when I was looking at that board for Scott. Yeah, the interesting thing up here, it says PS RAM 1, and it's got a Toshiba part number on there. That looks like a ROM to me. I'm curious just why it says PS RAM 1. Um, I mean, it could be, could be RAM, but it looks like a ROM to me, that mask ROM. And then, of course, we've just got some standard TTL and CMOS uh, logic uh, around the place here. 
Yeah, and it's clear that that RAM chip there is uh, for the uh, backup RAM. You know, you say it says there backup area, you save RAM. So yeah, that lithium uh, ion rechargeable battery may need to be swapping out at some point in future. But uh, yeah, I'm not in a rush just now. Yeah, so I'll have an inspection around the board, but I just want to just get that little bit of dirt and corrosion and stuff off around there. We'll go over it with a number of cotton buds. I mean, you can see it's pretty dirty. But then it, some of it might be flux from the manufacturer, but that bit there, that is definitely dirt. It's just dirt that's got in there. Yeah, the caps are all okay here. You can see a date here, uh, 8th of the 9th, 1994. And that's the revision, Neo CDM3-2. So I'm guessing there's perhaps a few different revisions of these uh, Neo CD boards, perhaps. So my Panasonic capacitors have arrived and uh, thankfully they're quite small, they're pretty low profile. There's some larger ones here but I think they'll fit, they're about the same height. So uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, replace all the ones I can actually. I'm not sure they should test this in two phases. Um, when I was heating I was sort of heating around here and that seemed to get it working but you know it does take like a minute or so. So I'm thinking it could be something around here. And it might not just be a cap, it could be a bad solder point but I've inspected this previously and I can't see any bad connections if I'm honest. So it's got to be capacitors, I hope it is. I hope it's not like some weird temperature related fault with one of these ICs here. Yeah, so they're at FR series again. I wasn't expecting them to be FR series. I mean they might be fake Panasonics but they look genuine to me. One of the things that can make these a bit tricky to remove is they bend the legs over you know so you've got the one on this side here bent that way and the one on the inside bent that way so yeah but the solders removed there yeah they smell kind of a little bit fishy actually I don't see any signs of leakage I mean there is a conformal coating over the board here you know it's got a kind of glossy look to it can you see so it's quite hard to see whether they have leaked but nevertheless that's uh, that's that one off so the first one was a 100 what's that is that going to be 33 or something yeah, that's a one microfarad. Positive marking indication there, and the negative is the band. You know, not the band, you know, a circle. Uh, that little circle, the white circle. So I've completely recapped this now. Um, the one observation is I didn't realise that one there was a 0 0.47. Now I've got some 0 0.47s, so I've replaced it, but it's not a Panasonic, it's a Nexing or something, it's probably super cheap. And there were one or two 100s, I didn't order enough 100s of the Panasonic, so I think there's like one here and one over there and one somewhere else. So I've had to use uh, some of those forever ones of Ali's, which yeah, they're not going to last forever, but they are good actually. I've measured them, they're good, I've used them in a number of things now and they've been reliable. But they're not as good as a Panasonic, so I could always just order some of those and just quickly take this to pieces and swap those out at some point in the future. Um, but that's all of them now, so I'm going to clean up the underneath of the PCB here, you know, just clean off uh, the flux of stuff from around where I've uh, soldered these caps, and then reassemble it and test it. Fingers crossed, I've got a feeling it's not going to make a difference. I've got a feeling I'm going to have some really obscure heat sensitive thing, it could even be one of the ceramic caps that's kind of, uh, I don't know, but it's unusual for that kind of behaviour with a ceramic cap to be honest, they fail, they crack, you know, that's what usually happens with those um, they don't work uh, when they just get slightly warmer oh, what is it with Neo Geo's, nothing's ever easy is it? I mean, I, I'll be honest, in the back of my mind I was kind of expecting these caps wouldn't fix it because, you know, I've kind of been here before with Neo Geo's like this, where you you think you know what the fault is, no you don't. So it's doing the same thing. I just heated up the board with the uh, hot air station there. Just in one side for, I don't know, a minute or two. I actually tried to reflow some of the little um, surface mounted resistors and caps and things there. I just reflowed that whole one side of the board and it was working straight away. Actually after doing that, no issues at all. So, you know, there's definitely something temperature related around there. I'm, uh, Bugger if I can work out what it is. So I think the next thing I'll do is take that board back out and I'm going to clean the top side of the PCB with uh, cotton buds and IPA around the quad flat packs because it's got to be either the conformal coating interfering here or mm, a bad connection or one of those components, the little caps or resistors, um, is intermittent. It's good. It's going to be incredibly difficult to try and work out what the, where the fault is with this. Because it's not like we've got a symptom. What I mean by that is, like, say for instance the laser wasn't bobbing up and down, or we saw the laser wasn't there at all. You've got a symptom. 
what we've got here is the laser, laser bobbing up and down as normal you can see the red laser there yeah you just can't see the disc so oh, I mean you know it's something to do with the pick up of the laser signal isn't it because at this point obviously it's not spinning all it's trying to do is detect the disc could it be the laser? No, I don't know it's a cheap Chinese laser but then why would it work once it's warmed up a little bit and work 100% reliably when it does so it is driving me to despair this uh, this is cold uh, well it's, it was warm a few minutes ago and then let it kill down swap switch it on holding the, the switch down can you hear it goes click click I'll do it again then and again so it's you know the, it's focusing it's trying to focus on the disc not doing anything uh, I just want to show you something else let's just just make sure that's still cool it is yeah okay switch on again not working okay hot air it's taken me ages to work this out actually because this is not what I would have expected now it may not be this chip the chip I'm focusing on here the BTL H bridge driver but it might be something nearby I mean the solder points look great on it actually so I'm inclined to think it's the chip itself and uh, switch it on hold the thing down Damn, it's not doing it now. Oh, this is just driving me nuts. Seriously, I'm making some progress here, and I'm also kind of starting to understand why I couldn't get Brian's Neo CD working. That RF chip there is super sensitive, and I'm not sure what makes it. Well, it's going to be, isn't it? But what I'm getting at here is I've never experienced this with any other CD system. Just watch this, right? Switch it on. Not doing anything, just watch this. I don't know if you can hear that. Let me just mute the TV. Just listen. Listen. Right, see, kid, listen. Can you hear that? Just put my finger in proximity of that chip there. So I'm probably clutching at straws here. You know, I've tried heating and cooling the, piece, the main PCB, not this, the main PCB there, uh, a number of times and I can't seem to influence it. It's, it is temperature related in the sense that, you know, if you keep retrying, closing the lid switch, close the lid switch, after a few minutes it then starts working and it struggles initially, you, but you try it a couple of times and then it gets better, it gets better and then suddenly it's perfect and you can, leave it, you can use it for hours, no problems at all, never a skip, never an error, never a nothing so it's very strange so I mean it could be that the laser diode is warming up from you know those uh, number of times where you've tried to get it to focus on the disc and then eventually it's up to a level where it's okay it's a bit weird I don't, don't think I've ever seen that kind of behavior before but uh, yeah there's a you can't really see it. it's not coming up very well on this camera here there's uh, just a crusty looking solder connection to that resistor there and I'm guessing that's one half of the divider for the um, voltage Maybe, might not be. I'm going to reflow that anyway. Uh, you can see I put a piece of tape here just between where the ribbon came down because you're not going to be able to see it very well. But the connections on the back of the ch uh, chip and the thing there, the connectors, were, are running right next to, you know, touching the ribbon. And I wondered if there was some inductive coupling going on, but yeah, that doesn't seem to have solved it. I mean, it might be that this is not thick enough, but still, why would it work after it's warmed up? That's the absolute mystery. You know, I can see you can see I cleaned the flux off some of these connections here because they were awful. I don't know if someone had reflowed those when they tried to look at this. Yes, yeah, so there's just this mystery as to why it works when it's warm. I mean, I have ordered a new laser in the meantime, but this was originally purchased as a new laser. So I'm getting nowhere fast with this. I did play around with the spindle height again. That is not anything to do with this at all. Um, I mean, it was originally. The spindle height was well out actually um, and it might need adjusting again now with a pressed audio disc let me just mute that you can hear it's working now it's loading but you know it took a, a couple of minutes just for it to warm up you know opening and closing I don't know a dozen times and then it started to read the disc it doesn't make any sense it was nothing to do with the solder points on the laser obviously because it's you know it's still the same um, I've played around with the focus pots here just in case it is something to do with the initial focus 
there and I'll explain in a little bit actually what I meant when I was talking about um, the spindle adjustment earlier on and the uh, tolerance of the um, focus you know because you've only got a certain amount of tolerance you've got the height that the focus can move from its bottom you know its lowermost position to its uppermost position and when you take into account the spindle height as well the spindle height can limit you um, but I've kind of ruled all that sort of side out it's got to be either the laser needing to warm up or something on here that's you know is intermittent that's temperature layered well it's not really intermittent it's temperature layered once it warms up it's all right i'm more inclined to think it's the laser because it was from ebay originally you know it came in one of these uh, boxes like this so yeah it's straight from china so i think i'm only going to know for certainty when the replacement laser arrives you know the new one i've ordered um, and that could be a week or so in the meantime I'm just going to leave this on for a few hours I mean I've been using it for hours at a time without a problem but I'll leave this on for a few hours now just try and uh, bed it in and we'll try a few cold starts again and see if that makes any difference but it's very strange at this stage and I, I don't really know what the cause actually is so it's going dark in here but uh, this has been on now for approximately five hours spinning away there no problems and it's just gone around the uh, demo mode here numerous times you know for like say five hours so there's definitely nothing wrong with the laser in the sense that it's on its last legs and it needs to warm up a bit to get working but it, you know the temperature thing is still there you just still need to warm it up before it'll work um, I'm just not clear as to whether it's the dry something on the drive PCB or the actual laser so my new laser has arrived uh, I mean bear in mind the original one it's not that one that's on there now is a new laser but it was bought ages ago and I couldn't test it at the time so yeah it's got the same style box as the other one it's uh, been a bit bashed in the post here but let's just check it's the right model yeah it's interesting can you see how much different that looks there it's like a really sort of bluey purple and just look at that one there it's like a light blue can you see the difference Let's see if we can get these side by side here super dark that one's super light so yeah the difference there straight away but uh, and in fact actually the pot looks different on here if I just remove that can you see that that's totally different different type of pot there it's got the right part number 8147AF but as you can see it's got a different pot you know it's definitely a, uh, an aftermarket I mean, look at the underneath of that there that's different can you see that yeah that's more like the original one this is a uh, you know certainly a replacement anyway we'll get this on there and uh, see whether it works or not so I've swapped it over bear in mind this is stone cold switch it on give it a sec yeah there we go so it was the laser after all of that messing around this is the problem this is the problem I mean the funny thing is with that laser like I said that laser does work but only when it's warmed up and when it works when it's warmed up it's actually totally reliable now it's struggling a little bit I can hear it scanning around here so the the level on the pot is not quite right I think that might be the next thing but it could also be that this one has still got an issue as well like the coils and things are not right uh, I'm not sure because I've had loads like that in the past where it's, it says it's brand new but uh, you just find it struggles to read um, it, you know and it's got nothing to do with calibration you could try and calibrate it further but anyway I'm going to uh, I'm just going to stick a little mark on here I could measure the resistance that's the best way to do it but I'm just going to stick a little mark down the side of it there so that I know exactly where it was when it came and I'm just going to just try a, a tweak one way and then a tweak the other just to see if that makes any difference at all to the initial read of a disc here and then I'll check it out with the scope again on uh, the, you know, the RF level on a scope so I'll just mute that a sec hang on yeah so I've got this working now but I have had to adjust all the pots again and the spindle height now it's no surprise because you know this is the reason you've got these pots and things on here but the spindle height is really annoying if you've got a really good laser that's you know the same as the original one almost you know the same manufacturer and everything generally you hardly ever need to adjust any of those things actually you might just need to tweak the tracking and the focus a little bit 
because there are some variations between the different units there but you know adjusting the spindle height that's not something you should ever have to do really but I mean someone had messed with this originally now if you remember earlier on I was having problems with the uh, pressed uh, CD I think I was trying to play uh, erotica actually the Madonna uh, pressed disc here and the upper tracks were a problem as soon as you got to like I don't know track 7, 8, 9 onwards it was just not it was not able to focus on the, the, the tracks there and at that point I realised it was the spindle I had to increase the spindle high a little bit and then everything seemed to work but then we ran into the temperature related problem well we still had the temperature related problem I recapped it thinking that was going to be the cause and it wasn't, it was actually the replacement laser so yeah this new laser again the spindle height has been adjusted again and it's lower down now I'll show you in a minute it's super close to the uh, lens there and I think that's correct I vaguely remember Scott's being a bit like that actually uh, but this is actually working, you know, if I show you on the screen here, one thing that I have noticed with this laser, I mean you saw it's a different colour there, the, the surface to it, so it's got a different pot, so yeah it's different, it's a third party, but just listen, you can hear it's super noisy, and even the, just in the uh, tracking and focus, can't get any quieter, just listen, hang on, if I just go down to track 2, you hear it clicking away there, in fact I'll point you at it, Yeah, sorry, there's a lot of traffic, but just listen, I'll go up a track. And again. And again. In fact, I'll just cl click the next button, that's the easy thing, just listen. Yeah, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I can read all the tracks on the disc there and they all sound fine and it's the same with a pressed CD as well. So yeah, it's definitely working but it is a lot noisier than that other unit we had on there before. But these pots uh, are optimal now. So I'll show you where we've ended up here. So those are not dissimilar to where they were before tracking uh, and that's tracking. But these have changed a little bit actually in order to get this just right. And I did tweak the uh, pot on the laser one way as well so I'll perhaps connect it up to the scope in a minute just to measure the RF level I'm going to test it again with some games now then we'll cold test it just to be sure but hopefully the new laser will have fixed that so just checking on the scope here again you can see if I just move that down or up actually one block is uh, 0.2 volts there so that's 0.2 volts I'll connect it up so that's on a press disc let's just move it down a little bit one, two, three, four, five and a half. We're a bit high there. I'm going to reduce it a bit to about a volt, I think. So we've got one, two, three, almost four. That's a little bit shy of 800 millivolts there, actually. Now, you may be wondering why would it go lower than a volt? Because you're probably expecting this to be, you know, I would expect this to be around a volt, actually, with a pressed disc. And it was a little bit higher than that. We've gone down, but we've gone lower. You know, we've gone down to 800 millivolts. And it's all about the life of the laser, as long as it's reading correctly. So therefore, what I mean by that is, it's not having to seek and re-seek, and you can hear it trying to find the track over and over again there. As long as that's not happening, and it's finding the tracks super quick, and the data that's coming back is okay, which you know you can hear with an audio track, you can actually hear whether it's okay or not. Um, you may as well have it lower. It's better to be lower than higher. And that will just result in a longer laser life, especially with a laser of questionable origin like the one that's on there at the moment. The uh, lower that level is set, the better, really. As long as, like I say, you, you've got the correct signal there, you know, as long as the, the system's working and it's working properly. So as I've mentioned on a number of videos, uh, Furtech, uh, I'll put a link down to his Patreon below, it's worth checking out his page there, maybe link to his Twitter profile as well. He's been creating the Neo Geo in FPGA form actually, and uh, I think just recently he's been contributing towards that um, MIST, was it called MISTER, the uh, FPGA PCB you can get there that you can stick different cores of different systems and I think he's producing an FPGA core for that so I would assume it's not going to be much more effort for him to support the CD because the architecture is pretty much the same it's just the CD side of things you know and some subtle differences with the address map and stuff I think um, but they are subtle differences from what I understand but Furtech has also created um, the first 
SD solution to uh, one of these drives, you know, so it's a little PCB that just connects to the ribbon there. Uh, and it's still in development, but he's made really good progress with it. There's a few videos. I'll perhaps stick a link down to one or two of those as well, I think, down below. Um, you know, and the idea is you stick all your ISOs on an SD card and uh, it comes up with a menu and you select your ISO and it boots and it runs, you know, emulates the drive from the uh, PCB there. So, yeah, that will be really cool. Ho hopefully at some point, Fertech gets around to finishing that off and perfecting it. I'll perhaps purchase one of those and have a go at uh, swapping the uh, drive mechanics out for that because I mean it, it would be nice to do that you know I just put this drive into storage and just stick the SD solution in there it's more convenient faster loading times generally even if he's you know even if he's gone with the same loading speed you know like for like one-to-one -one representation it's still better because it means you've not got wear and tear on your optical side of things because that laser whilst it's good now it's not gonna last forever uh, especially with the questionable origins of it so I'll quickly show you this. I could have done some more professional graphics or something to represent this, but that's our disc side on. And in the middle here, we have our spindle. Yeah, coming up like that. And then over here, we've got the optical pickup. Let's say it's sat like that there. Yeah. This optical pickup is connected to this like a spring assembly on each side there with coils. So the coils obviously pull this down or up. So you know it's, it'll have a maximum position of say there and it could have a, its lowest position is down there. So let's just set the tolerance there. Let's just show you from the sides there. So those are the positions it could go. You know it can go right to the bottom or right to the top. Uh, and this is where the spindle height comes in because the optimal position may well be uh, a, a bit lower or a bit higher. So for example you might want your tolerance to be there to there. Do you see what I mean? So if your spindle height is set too low you've got the disc too near to this so when the laser wants to go you know right down to the very bottom which might be this position here you can see it's a little bit higher. It's here. Does that make sense? I hope you can understand what I'm trying to convey there, that the spindle height is absolutely pivotal in uh, getting the right tolerance window here, you know, because it's only got that finite range it can move up and down. And if, if the, you know, the very edges of the disc, let me just show you another example here. So, for example, right, there's our laser. This is our laser. You know, it can scan up and down the disc like this and obviously inside there the little laser can bob up and down you know the, the lens can bob up and down so you know the whole thing wouldn't move up and down like that but the the lens in the middle would so if your disc's got a wobble let's just put it at a slight angle like that maybe that's a bit too much of an angle when you're on the inside here and you're moving across can you see we're, we're a certain distance from the disc now it may well be that the coming back to the uh, tolerance thing again your tolerance might be that line there yeah so as long as your laser has got capability to be within that light, light line there it can bob up and down and focus on the disc but if you've got a slight wobble this is at a slight angle like that when you're on the inside tracks here you may be okay up until a point where you get so far across there you go can you see the dotted line above it you're out you're out you can't read those other tracks there when the disc's wobbling on the end. So I mean that's an extreme example of an angle there, but you do get a wobble. You'll see, if you look at the edge of the disc, you'll see it going do 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 like that. Whereas the centre of the disc, if you focus very closely on it, it's just, it's hardly moving at all. And that is uh, the issue there, you know, you could just go slightly out of that, that line there with your tolerance of your focus. And again, that's where your spindle height is pivotal again. But those are the reasons why I hate working with optical drives because these analog components, you know, in an ideal world, you'd have something that's been engineered precisely so you wouldn't have wobble. And you'd also have no way of incorrectly setting the spindle adjustment there. There would be a notch or a measurement or a mark or something, or even something in the service manual that's, that gives you an indication of the exact height, you know, between uh, the bottom of the spindle there. So you know exactly where to set it. Um, and that is, this is the other issue here, that when you get third party lasers, they're going to vary. You may have to adjust the spindle, you may have no choice.
So the interesting thing with the Neo CD version, you can pick which mission you want to start off, which is quite cool actually. Yeah, loading time's not too bad actually. I think that's missing some speech. It's the the NBS version go, mission one starts. I'm sure it does. But yeah, that's one of the downsides to the OGS TV. There are some limitations, you know, compared with the NBS and NES versions of those games. Aside from this low loading, but bear in mind if you get the CDZ, you get uh, you know dual speed driver I mentioned earlier, so load times are a lot better than CDZ. But CDZ has that copy protection built in, I think. Those uh, lines look awful. In fact, I'll just show you the RGB actually before I forget. Just pause it a sec if I can. Oh, you can't pause this game. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, there you go. So, plugging in the uh, RGB cable, can you see the difference here down these uh, the, the water stuff and everything? It just looks so much clearer. It's crystal clear. But as I say, I'm missing the sound. And the reason I'm missing the sound, as I say, that is the audio cable that I use with the AES. So what I could do is put that into a 3.5mm socket and uh, feed off to two of these. And then those, you know, obviously would plug in the uh, sound output on the back of there. And we would have RGB with sound then. So there we go, there's the final result, looking super clean and tidy. The final spindle height, I would say it's about almost the height of the spindle itself, the thickness of it, if you, you know, if you feel the thickness of that, you know, above the uh, level here. So that's where I ended up. Um, if you have it any lower, you know, if you have it too low, it will start to rub on the plastic here. So you've got to make sure it's above that level by about its own height. So as I mentioned before, there are some limitations in the amount of RAM that this has got available to it. You know, a cartridge normally you've got an awful lot of RAM, you know, 768 megabits. So I think you can go up to a gigabit, can't you, with the right uh, bank switch and stuff there. But nevertheless, yeah, these are limited compared to an MBS or an AES. I think you've got 56 megabits, uh, about 7 megabytes of RAM. Um, I've ordered a copy of Samurai Showdown for this, Samurai Showdown 2, and I'll get Samurai Showdown 1 as well, actually, because I do uh, quite like those games. They're quite good. Um, but I was trying to think of something witty to stick on this, because I usually do when I keep a system for myself. So, yeah, for the label for this one, um, I'm going to bear in mind this is the slower model. Um, and I don't really have a problem with the speed of it actually, it's pretty good, but yeah, I thought we'd go with the Samurai Slowdown there, actually. Um, as I say, the uh, CDZ, what's that little white mark there? Yeah, I got that little white mark off, I don't know what it was, it was a bit, a bit of paint or something stuck there, but anyway. Yeah, as I say, the uh, CDZ model is dual speed, but actually I think the speed, the load times and things aren't, aren't bad actually, they're pretty good. You know, they're not dissimilar to, I don't know, a PS1 or something like that. So yeah, the criticism these get for slow load times, uh, I think it's sort of unnecessarily really. So this is the kidney stick that a lot of people actually ended up purchasing to use with the Neo Geo CD. Although it says uh, advanced a entertainment system there, you know, it's for the AES I think. Which is interesting, because uh, I tended to associate this with the Neo CD. But yeah, very clicky stick there, I love this stick, it's really good. So yeah, this was purchased faulty as well, but obviously, you know, I got this work in the previous video as well. Yeah, and this is one of the original controllers that would have come with one of these as well. This again was a repair in a previous video. The contacts just needed cleaning up. One of the problems with these is the micro switches don't last forever. If anybody finds a replacement micro switch for one of these, please let me know in the comments below because it's something I've been uh, thinking of for a long while. It would be really nice if we could swap out the, the micro switches in those. Yeah, so a lovely system to have in the collection. I do hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching and uh, I'll see you in the next video.